members, we're now going to move on to session nine, which is basically the conclusions and way forward. We'll invite each of the resource persons to just do a wrap up of the last two days. Um, if you have any questions at the end, please feel free. Uh, we can start with Madam Speaker. Um, I'm first going to um, deal with the privileges um, issue. Um, I see one or two faces I didn't see this morning. And um, they may want to um, have copies of the, the cases. I'm going to leave those with the clerk. Um, so members who wish can, you know, it's always best when you, you read it for yourself, you have a better understanding. And um, what I would like to say is that, um, what I stressed this morning is that um, the privileges that are afforded to parliamentarians are basically two of them, freedom of speech and um, free movement in the sense of arrest and all these other things when in the precincts of the parliament. Um, the issue of um, contempt, um, when members commit com contempt or even media or outside um, persons is very circumscribed and um, the powers that the British Parliament has to um, confine is not available. But certainly the, the, the um, sanction of, of censure can be used in such a manner as to make the point that um, Parliament will not tolerate um, being held in contempt in any way, both inside, outside the house or howsoever. And to, I'm, I'm pleased to note that, um, well, I know no two, two jurisdictions have, um, or even three, because Jamaica has, to a lesser extent, jurisdiction dealing with um, privileges isn't that correct? Jamaica has so, but um, I looked at the one of um, Cayman Islands, and it seems to be even more comprehensive than the one from Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I want to assure you that I'm going to take these back with me, because I, I've been one who has been advocating for Dominica to um, introduce legislation dealing with immunities and powers and privileges because it, it makes things a lot clearer. Yes, we have the common law situations, but as you know, um, common law situations lend themselves to a certain level of interpretation. And although um, legislation itself may lend itself to interpretation, certainly, um, if something has been written into law, it, it's, even, it's that much more certain than just left it, leaving it to pick up the common law situation. Um, on the other matter which I spoke about, which is the role of members of parliament, including the role of the backbenchers, um, I, I pointed out the um, role of the speaker, the massive powers that the speaker has, and I try to stress the importance of um, the role um, that members of the opposition have as it relates to the questions and that they, if they um, apprise themselves or get persons who are have a full command of the English language to write their questions for them. I'm, I'm not casting aspersions on any members here. It's just that in, 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 in the free and the heat of things, it's always better to have somebody less passionate to, 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 to draft the question. Because basically, as, as, as is generally admitted, members ask questions for which they know the answer. They just want to sort of force the government side to admit it and then at the same time put it before the public. 
but they come across uh, most times in asking the question in less than a, a proper manner, and all they end up with is a yes and no answer, which does not help their situation. I also um, pointed out that um, backbenchers of the government side um, frequently, um, if you like, perhaps it may not be the best word to use, but it, it, it essentially that's what it is, retaliate. And when questions are asked of government that are particularly a sore point, especially money spent on travel and other things like that, you will find that the backbencher is made to ask a question of a former government minister in a similar position, you know, to bring that out as well. And um, I didn't mention it this morning, but, um, but uh, there was a, a something that happened at, at, at one of the most recent sittings of the House where a member of the opposition, not on his feet, but, you know, this cross talk that goes on, accused one of the members of the government of being a thief. And although I called on him to, and I braided him for it, and he withdrew and all the rest, he, um, the member who was on his feet at the time simply said that, you know, um, Madam Speaker, well, you know, it's one thing to call somebody a thief, but when you have a member who was given um, an, um, travel, he, he put in a claim to travel, he was paid the advance of, I think it was $10,000, never traveled, and up to today has not paid the advance. You'll want to know who's a thief and who is not. So <laughs> the response was, was, was very swift, and I mean, <laughs> I, I myself, I was, I, was, uh, I was taken aback, you know, that um, when the member started, I, I was wondering, well, where is he going with that? Until he, you know, it, it, it was, so you, you, you find all of this. And um, then too, there's the issue of backbenchers um, being more or less available to be on, on, on various committees because they are not as committed by, as ministers. And on the, that's on the government side, on the opposition side, well, I mean, everybody's a backbencher if you want to put it that way. And then, of course, I also spoke of the, although I did not go into le any lengthy discourse about it, was the fact that um, even women members have an important role to play in parliament. And um, I did point out that we are woefully lacking and we're certainly not going to meet our millennium development goals as we're going in the Caribbean. I mean, we're striving for 30% when we are right now at 12 and a half percent, if that. <laughs> Although, of course, places like Guyana and Trinidad have, and even um, after the last elections, um, Bahamas have, you know, Im improved their, their, their percentages. Um, Jamaica, I think, is 22? 30 in the Senate, but in the House, it's something like 13. 13. Well, I was doing the, the, the total in all. So, um, that is one way in which, of course, the governments try to make up in, in, in getting the percentage up so that they, they pump up the, the Senate with women to help, to, help to, to make it look a little better. I don't have any difficulty with that, quite frankly. Um, I mean, whether it's in the Senate or in the House, um, the more women, the better. <laughs> I see members smiling, I guess. I take the smile to mean that they agree with me. I'm not going to take it any other way. And nodding, right. And, and the nodding is up and down, not sideways, so that's good too. <laughs> and then finally, um, as far as the, the question of um, members, um, role of members is concerned, of course. Members have to learn the, the standing orders, um, especially when it how, how it relates to their code of behavior, their, the way they, they, they address um, their, their self during the beats and so. And, and um, I don't know what happens in your jurisdiction, but um, 
I've been to a few um, parliaments and I get the distinct impression that members don't read their papers before they come to the House. And, and, and I, I dare say that is why there's this bobbing and weaving when it, the time is to, to rise to speak. They wait until they read a little more and hear a little more from the other side. <laughs> Having said all of this though, I want to thank the Parliament of um, Cayman Islands for thinking me able to come and assist you in your um, post-election seminar. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, um, I'm beginning to feel that um, Cayman Islands is taking over from St. Lucia as my second home. And um, just to let you know that I intend to spend my Christmas here in Cayman, so. <laughs> That, that, that tells volumes, you see, you put your money where your mouth is and actions do speak louder than words, don't they? <laughs> and so thanks again for having me here with you. I hope that I was able to assist in whatever small way that I could. Thank you. Okay, well, just, just to recap, um functions of parliament, main thing is the making of laws, but we did speak about the oversight of the executive. Um, two things we didn't really highlight, <coughs> approving the budget, the <coughs> country's budget for the year, and uh, the ratification of treaties. It, that's not really applicable in the Cayman Islands because I know you, your treaties would be ratified by um, the UK. However, in Jamaica, ratification is, in theory, is done in, by parliament, but in practice, never done. Um, parliamentarians need to always be reminded of their role as representatives of the people, and there are two limbs in the, in the representation, the work you do in parliament and the work you do in your constituency. And we can, in all of that, we must remember the very critical role of backbenchers and opposition members. Participation in committee is, is the other aspect of it. And we're talking about meaningful contribution to the parliamentary work, meaningful contribution in debates and in the committee participation and when I'm saying meaningful, I'm talking about things that are well researched and you know, people know what, you know, you don't just come and just talk for the sake of talking. Um, we spoke about the importance of committees in getting the business of the house done and you know, trying to man the committees, trying to get persons who are committed to man the committees and chair the committees. Uh, the issue of oversight being critical and therefore is ideal to really have, um, especially where it comes on to finances, public administration, it, the ideal situation is to have a member of the opposition chair the committee. Um, respect for the standing orders, you need to know them, to respect them and to apply them and you need to you know, recognize that standing orders are not the sole source of parliamentary practice and procedures. You have conventions that, you know, um, speakers' rulings, all of these things are aspects of parliamentary practice. And you really want to, for your parliament to be, to perform at its optimal level, members need to know what the rules of the house are. You know, you have to know the rules of the game, so that um, the, from the side of the aspect of the speaker, impartiality is the, the, the word that should govern the speaker's um, role in parliament. On the question of allocating time, you need to allocate time to allow for adequate contribution, especially for private members' business. Government time, yes, it it's takes government business takes precedence, but private members' business is as important. So you know, time needs to be allocated specifically for private members' motions, questions, and um, opportunity. Also, not just the time, the opportunity. So you know, if you have a statement, members must be uh, um, afforded the opportunity to to ask questions, and again, it's not just asking questions 
ad infinitum is really asking questions that really are helping the public to understand the issue at hand and not just asking questions to maybe to just embarrass the government. So that again, that, you know, that, that's very important. And then we spoke about the administration and financing of parliament. I am a proponent, I, I suffer daily from this lack of autonomy. So I would always be preaching that gospel until something gives. You know, and the basis of the main basis of the argument is the issue of oversight. You know, you need some level of independence to offer appropriate oversight. And just one little one, I thought I'd stick in here that w when I heard Madame Speaker talking and you know people calling people thief in Parliament, we have what you call unparliamentary language, and thief is not a word you want to hear in le your legislature. No, you know. You know, and the, the cut and thrust is sometimes very amusing, and the, 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 the wit is amusing. I, I'll just share one with you. We had a, um, a member of parliament. He was a minister for many years, too. And even as a minister, he was a, a heckler. So he sat in his seat and was facing an, a, a member, and the member wears his hair black and white. So this part of the hair is black, the left side is black, one side is black, and one side is white. And the Minister of Finance, this person was like, I think he was Minister of Housing or something, and the, the, the black and white member across the way. So the, the Minister of Finance is there talking about the GCT and, you know, trying to get the country to understand what this increase was all about, and serious argument, and out of, Nowhere came this from the, the minister. See there where, where they must put GCT, increase GCT on, on hair dye. And the whole place broke. And you know, his, his wit was so swift and you know, just, just this, you know, every time he came out with something like that, the speaker couldn't say anything because it, the moment just passed. And there was no point, yes. You have that. Yes, you know, so that, that is the thing. So it, 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 it livens up the place. So anybody who was falling asleep, it would have, you know, so like that, you can't really, you know, there's this, the, the idea is really the speaker shouldn't even hear that, hear in speaker's terms, mm -hmm. you know? You don't take on things like that. But, and so you will have that. But the name calling and all of that is, you know, as I say, falls on, on parliamentary language. So. It was absolutely my pleasure to have been here, to have been asked by CPA and to have been here over the last two days. And I hope that even one little thing that I've said would stick with each of you. Thank you. Um, it's just as, as um, Heather said about the um, Parliament. I always remember a, a joke. Um, Betty Boothroyd gave us um, w when we used to have these um, gathering of um, world presiding officers at, at United Nations. She said that um, a member of the government stood up and asked and said to her, Madam Speaker, may I address the member for so and so as a sewer rat? She says, of course not, you know you can't do that. And um, the member responded and says, Madam Speaker, the sewer rats of London will be forever in your debt for your ruling. <laughs> oh, God. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Which just goes to show, members can say a whole lot. It's never what you say, it's, it's how, how you say it. it. Honourable members, if there are no more questions, that brings us to the end of our post-election seminar. I would like to thank you for your cooperation. Um, it's been a delight being here in the Cayman Islands. Good afternoon. As Speaker of this Honourable House, it gives me great pleasure, yet a degree of sadness, to say thank you um, to the very able and capable presenters who stop from their very busy schedule to come across to their Caribbean brothers and sisters in a political arena to share their knowledge. And I'm sure, as we predicted from the very beginning, 
that there would be some sharpening of iron, and I believe on behalf of my colleagues, it would be in order to say that our irons have now been sharpened, all for the better for the Caymanian jurisdiction, but for the Caribbean on the whole. I want to especially thank once again our Honorable Premier for assisting with the hosting and as well as requesting in his um, speech to the nation a post-election seminar. We are grateful to have the media here, um, but especially those from the government, Cayman Islands Television Station, and I had their assurances that the knowledge that we gain here in the past two days would in fact, in a basis of our modus operandi of transparency and accountability, be shared with the wider public. So we will have start not just a new thing, and educating ourselves as parliamentarians, but sharing that knowledge with the wider public so that when they come to our various constituency offices, um, the level and the bar have been risen a bit more. But as modern day politicians, we welcome that initiative. So thanks, Honorable Premier. I want to thank um, Arlene from the CPA headquarters, and obviously, apologies have been rendered on behalf of the, um, its excellency, the, um, Mr. Dr. Shisher, William Shisher, who was unable to be here. But obviously we are in his thoughts and prayers and vice versa, we wish him a speedy recovery. We wish for you to convey back our heartfelt um, gratitude for the remainder of the staff of the CP. And we look forward to engaging in partnerships which will empower parliamentarians within the Commonwealth and beyond um, that jurisdiction to move forward as we try to preserve, enhance, and indeed augment the democracy. Some have said that it is not a perfect form of government, but it's the best we've found so far. So we've embraced it here in Cayman, and I have the audacity of hope that for many decades to come, what is done here today, although we've planted the seeds, some will come along and water, some will harvest, but at the end of the day, the beneficiaries of it all will be the Caymanian people and our Caribbean brothers and sisters. So without further ado, let me on behalf of this honorable parliament say thank you, thank you, thank you, and there's no expiration dates and a welcome to the warm shores of the Cayman Islands.